I wanted to make sure that there are lots of different ways for us to engage. So you have a bit of paper. It's the kind of boring, systematic, step-by-step -step approach for those who would like to just read through what my thinking is actually doing. I have a PowerPoint which has quotes that might seem slightly tangential, but... I think I left my eyes up here. No, I didn't. They're there. There you go. Oh. <laughs> You're welcome. I have, I have quotes that might seem slightly tangential that are kind of some of the theological thought that's underpinning this um, and some pictures behind them and then I'm just <coughs> going to tell some stories and thread some thoughts together so I hope that there'll be something to engage in there for everyone. Transgender identities are transgressive callings in personhood and in ministry. I am transgender and so I transgress. <coughs> By transgress here, though, I don't actually mean sin in the traditional meaning of the word. In fact, isn't the very pro connection of these words problematic? By transgress, I mean that our identities cross idolatrous, cultural and religious boundaries. And I say our identities because I am one of those who transgress. I am other. I am called to transgender personhood, to be a person who has transitioned across and continues to transgress gender binaries. But I'm also called to ministry, to speak the gospel truth, to power in love, to care for those who are part of the communities that we serve God within. So I've been starting to try to think about how can we theologize about being trans? How can I systematically explain what it means to be a person who believes in the gospel and is trans? So a lot of this necessarily comes from my own personal experience, which I'm privileged that I can talk about a lot more here than I can in my academic research. But personal experience isn't just about me, it's about all of us, it's about who we are together as community and communities. It's where we can catch glimpses of God. Look around you, who are we? Are we individuals? Are we a community yet? Individual, individualism is a necessary part of communal formation. But relationship is a necessary part of being an individual, of being created in the image of God. And I believe that the tension between the individual and the religious community started to become apparent during the Reformation. Incidentally, when I talk about Reformation here, I'm often going to be talking about concepts and ideas rather than history. So it's easy when only one person in the room is able to read the scripture. It's easy to maintain a strong sense of unified identity. But this isn't community. It's hierarchical, and so in effect the identity of that one person, the one who has the power to read the scripture, is the only identity that's being communicated. It's a monologue. A major effect of Reformation was the gradual access to, uh, to scripture for each individual, so discussion <coughs> and disagreement become possible. And each individual can gradually assert their view, which as we've reflected, can lead to good things and bad things. It can lead to greater understanding of what it means to be a community formed in the image of God, or it can lead to schism, factions, and even more hierarchical leaders. True communal identity can't be hierarchical, nor can it be sharply divided. So how do we form our identities as individuals and as communities? Trans identity is an extreme expression of this perceived dichotomy between individual and communal formation. In ecclesial reports, transgender identities are often <coughs> critiqued as being individualistic or selfish even, which in my experience could not be further from the truth. Our identities are actually dialectic and reflexive. They're formed in conversation, in our relationship with our bodies, our relationship with gendered others, and our relationship with something larger, which in my case is God. We can talk about vertical and horizontal imaging of God. The vertical image is seen when we become God's dialogue partner, when we respond to call. The horizontal occurs when we respond to the call of others. And this dialoguing is a crucial part of identity formation, particularly when one's identity is open to change. So how does this function? Dialoguing in the image of God is always call and response. God calls, we respond. Others call, we respond. We call, others respond. And this call has got to be open to genuine response that is not overdetermined or shaped by the call. God gives us utter freedom. As such, good conversation allows the caller and the responder to speak truthfully of and from who they are, the very centre of who they are. 
Conversation that seeks to conform the other to our own views is at best distorted dialogue and at worst, as we mentioned before, monologue. Call leads one beyond one's own boundary itself and can break open hard or closed communication structures. Do you know who you are? How do you know? I wonder if all of our identities are the response to a call. But trans people know that. Transition was and is for me a gradual and continuing response to a call that I believe will never end. It started as many calls do with a sense of disquiet, an understanding that something was not quite right. As a child, I used to refer to myself as an alien, which sounds actually quite humorous to my adult years, but as a child, being alien is anything but funny. I was isolated and I believed that I needed to work out where I came from so I could go back there and belong, which actually as an adult I realised was probably a form of suicidal ideation. I didn't believe that I belonged on Earth. I didn't understand that I was being called to transition, but I did understand that I was being called beyond my own borders, beyond where I was, to be located somewhere else. I heard the call to change and I was trapped in a society whose closed structures hid the possibility of change from my eyes. As a teenager, they were not just hidden, but completely obscured. I couldn't hear God anymore at all, and I couldn't see that anything in the world was good. I became increasingly shut in. I could not seek change. I could not be called beyond my own borders because I was not able to enter into any kind of dialogue about who I was. Self-harm and alcohol abuse became a regular reality. I became entangled in risky behaviors and abusive relationships. My relationship with my body was entirely monological. My body shouted loudly about what it was and what it couldn't be, and I suppressed its voice by harming it. <laughs> Thankfully, though, God's call is louder than human resistance, and things do change. God brought me into open communication and relationship structures that allowed me to hear the call again from surprising places. I was called by God through others to start expanding my sense of self beyond my physical borders to listen to those who had transitioned gender, to listen to those who loved their bodies and explored with them, be it through wonderful relationships, good sex, the kink scene, body modification, or simply caring for their bodies in exercise or pampering. And as I began to listen to others, I began to listen to my body again. And as I began to listen to my body, I was able to listen to God. I heard the call from beyond, a call to follow and respond, a call to allow God to recreate my body in order to follow that calling. A call to personal integrity through transition. Personal integrity, though, has an interesting relationship with power. Call is mediated through humans, and as such, humans need to be centres of communication. We need to be somewhere that we can talk from. We need to have a structured sense of self that allows us to both call to others and to be open to the calls of others without our identities becoming distorted. Without personal integrity, a strong and maintainable sense of self that is open to change, but not distorted by the expectations of others, real dialogue is completely impossible. The formation and maintenance of this integrity, though, relies on the other. For me, transition was the start of the formation of individual personal integrity. As I allowed my body and the ways in which I was named in society to be gradually reformed, my sense of self, my understanding of God's callings to me, my relationships with others and my relationship with my body began to line up. I looked and act and felt like me. I cannot overstate how good being true to yourself and to God feels. I felt alive again. And it's this new life, this rebirth, so to speak, that enabled me to hear God's calling to ministry and to respond, to follow, to walk into a new future, to be part of transformation not only of self, but of whole communities. Unfortunately, though, I began to come into contact with closed communication structures. Individuals, communities, institutions, and aspects of society that were not at all open to God's transforming call, or that refused to see my identity as part of that call. It doesn't matter how open and communicative and reformed you are if you encounter a brick wall. You cannot go through it in your own power. Some of the closeness was institutional. The ecclesial bodies that did not allow me to speak due to my trans status, or that required extra psychiatric evaluation and external advice before accepting me. 
The DBS checking system that required me to disclose my old name, forcing me to communicate an identity that was not my own. The NHS system that doesn't enable me to access essential healthcare services. I won't be grateful for a service that won't care for me. Some of the closeness was societal. The public toilets that only had urinals or open stalls, forcing me to cross my legs for whole days and wonder why on earth it's assumed that all men have bodies that are capable of peeing standing up. The Cambridge assumptions that formal is either a tux or a dress. The gay bars that wouldn't let me in. The well-meaning cisgender men and women who presumed and continue to presume to speak for trans people without actually stopping to listen to our stories. And then some of the closeness was personal. The also well-meaning tutor who suggested that I shouldn't be out as transgender. The student who told me I shouldn't wear nail varnish if I wanted to be a man. The other student who said that people might not want to be represented by someone like me. The elder who decided that myself and my wife were too modern before they even met us. And the individuals who opposed our marriage, not explicitly naming the reasons. And this isn't about judgment or punishment. I'm not saying that these people or institutions were bad. I have no more right to judge them than they do to judge me. But they are human, which sometimes means being wrong and being closed. They are human, and the problem comes when they think they're God. These closed structures, this God orientation, blocks personal integrity. It's pretty hard to live as a whole person in the image of God when others simply won't see you. So how do we begin to seek reformation? The reformation in some ways and aspects continues Jesus' leg activist legacy, most clearly seen in the overturning of tables. Oppressive and closed power structures need to begin to be opened as individuals listen to God's call in communication with others. Dialogue can be reconformed, reformed to Christ, whose openness to the other, yes to and of God, incomprehensible love and the breaking down of the societal tools of impression. We can in fact speak loudly enough to shatter brick walls in the power of the spirit, which breaks open, closed, hard communication structures. If the church is to be semper reformanda, then it must continually witness to this breaking open. We must help and support trans people to break open the gender binary. The walls that we need to face are part of biblical interpretation, ecclesial praxis, theological research, societal prejudice, and institutional blindness. Breaking down the wall of narrow biblical interpretation is an essential step. We read the Genesis creation narrative through a lens of English translation. We say the Bible, the English Bible is written by God. We turn Ha-Adam, the human, into a male name, not Hebrew. We use male pronouns that do not exist in Hebrew. And we assume that the Hebrew masculine form, generally used to signify gender neutrality in an ancient language, which has no neutral, means man or maleness. It's just not correct translation. Why has no one translated Genesis properly? <laughs> A really full Genesis creation narrative looks more like this. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So God created the human in God's image. In the image of God, they were created, masculine and feminine. God created them. Or God took the human side and closed up the place with flesh. And then God made a woo man from the side he had taken out of the human and brought her to the human. And the human said, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called taken out of man. Problematic in all sorts of ways we know, but actually the human only recognizes itself as a person once the other half of itself is shown to it as a mirror. This resonates a lot more with other philosophical and religious creation stories prevalent at, in the ancient world. So it makes a lot more sense. And almost all of them contain some idea of dyad, such as that in Plato's Symposium. Plato talks powerfully about the three sexes, which were greater than the gods, and talks about Zeus actually splitting the sexes to make them weaker. And it says that actually, if humans continue to think that they're greater than God, Zeus will just split them in half again. Imagine that if we were to be split in half again. And that's a wonderful tale because it actually posits people who are somewhere in between male and female as somewhere nearer to the original image. 
What if we read Genesis with an openness to the potential of dyadic as the original intended created form of humankind? What if the human's request to have a helper led to it being split in two, leading ultimately to the breakdown of human integrity and relationship? What if we view trans and intersex people as intentionally and wonderfully created by God? Doesn't that change things? We should read scripture as fully and widely and respectfully and well as we can in order to fully discern the word of God for us today. We then need to break down the walls of ecclesial praxis, which can be both explicitly and implicitly closed. Praxis that excludes people on the grounds of gender is not only discriminatory, it further reinforces the binary, which is not only closed to the realities of trans and intersex people, but of all humans created in God's image. It's not just about ministry, although I must note my concerns that I'm the first and only out transgender ordinand in the history of the URC. What's that about? But it's also about the smaller, practical things. From gender neutral toilets, by the way, have you noticed that in this building only the woman's toilet has a mirror in it? I used it earlier, sorry. <laughs> so gendered toilets, gendered home groups. We need to rethink this stuff. There are places for it, but actually, are we just blocking out the reality of what God and humanity is? We need to assess how open we are in the church to the realities of those who simply don't fit into the system. And then we need to start to tackle theology, because actually, if all theology and ecclesial history is written by cisgender people, people who strongly identify as man or woman, then closed attitudes to trans realities will always exist. We need to help and allow trans people to tell their own stories. I'm lucky. My story is a happy one. I'm doing a research degree that allows me to explore this stuff. I'm married to an amazing woman. I'm continuing to explore the breadth and depth of my gender identity, and I'm training to serve God in Christian ministry. But not all trans stories end happily. In preparing for a recent service of transgender remembrance, I discovered that nearly 300 trans people have been murdered in the past year by both institutions, states, and individuals as a result of being trans. Most of them suffered horrific violence that directly and specifically targeted aspects of their trans identity. The vast majority of those convicted of these crimes <coughs> cited religious motivations. If God creates and chooses life, Christ redeems life and the Holy Spirit brings life, surely this death is the ultimate result of closed systems. And this is where it all becomes intersectional. Because in these situations, the majority of people killed were in Latin America, the majority of people killed identified as women, the majority of people killed were li living under the oppression of poverty. And actually, it's got something to do with the patriarchy. I used to hate that word and never want to use it, but it's not just about gender, it's not just about men are best, it's about money and control and how we use systems that divide and conquer. So I want us to consider whose stories we're telling how we're telling them, and if we are imaging Christ in doing so. I'd just like to finish with a poem that kind of almost says everything that I have said, but in a different, more creative way. So if you forget everything else, hopefully you'll leave with this. Who am I? A centre of contradiction, loud, flowing, strong. <coughs> a gendered contradiction. Call me wrong, and you deny the unity of God, many yet one. I am a child openly weak, laughing at ignorance, full of cheek. Call me wrong, and you deny Christ, who calls to me, little one. I am a body, changed and yet the same, chest scarred by surgery, yet female sex remains. Call me wrong to tell you this, and you deny creation, bliss. See, it is good. I am a contradiction, and I claim the right to be. Man, woman, who cares? I'm something in between. Don't call me wrong to question, because then you deny the one who calls, the still, small voice who names me all in all. I am who I am as you are you. Call us wrong, and you call God a liar too. You ask me, who am I? I answer, who are we? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. We are going to have...